All right, in this video, we're going to work through and explain some of the parameters that are found in your parameter file, which is needed to run all of the programs in EM Clarity. The example is found in your docs folder and called masterparam.m. It's just a plain text file, so you can name it whatever you wish. I typically go something like param0, param1, param2, corresponding to each cycle of alignment that I'm working on. So taking a look at the screen, you can see that anything that's starting with a percent sign is a comment and that inline comments are not allowed. So if I were to add a comment here, that would actually break the parser, so don't do that. Additionally, you don't want any spaces between the assignment operator, the equal sign, and the variable you're assigning. Uh, third note is that there's only a few of these parameters that can be specified as strings, and those are the ones that are specified as strings to start. So now we'll go through the parameters one by one and explain what they mean. So subtomo meta just refers to the metadata about your experiment, and you'll enter a name there. You can change that in the middle of an experiment if you want, and you'll just have to make a copy of the binary file that has a recording of all your data. And that way you can play with different groupings of parameters and compare the results without overwriting anything. So I've called it the EM Clarity tutorial here. Uh, importantly, this name can start with a letter and it can contain numbers and underscores, but that's it, no other special characters and it cannot start with a number. The second parameter called fast scratch disk refers to a secondary site for processing, particularly for 3D CTF correction, as well as Tomo CPR. Both of those programs rely on IMOD uh, components pretty heavily that write to and from disk, so it's particularly important, if at all possible, to write that to some solid state drive. Ideally, you'd be working entirely from a solid state drive for the entire project, but depending on how big your data set is, that might not be feasible. So in addition, if you're working on a distributed computing environment and you know, in, so in my case on the slave nodes, they have this directory called local cache, which is a fast solid state disk, then everything will be copied to that that is needed for these particular runs. If you don't have anything or if you're just going to run in your current working directory, your project directory, just go ahead and leave that blank and everything will be fine. All right, number of GPUs is self-explanatory. It's the number of GPUs that you have available to you. Um, and that fits in with the hardware requirements, of course, being greater than 12 gigabyte memory. Okay, so all of the parameters are specified with respect to full sampling and they're specified in angstroms. So for the yeast ADS data, the particle radius is about 160 angstroms. And then I use a slightly larger size for the alignment mask radius and for the classification mask radius. Uh, in addition, there's the mask type. This can be cylinder, sphere, or rectangle. So for the ribosome, which is a mostly globular protein, I'd actually use sphere, not cylinder, uh, is left over from a viral capsid protein. And then we have the sampling rate for both the alignment steps or the classification steps, which can be different. Um, and this is going to depend, obviously, on your alignment procedure. But in this case, the pixel size is only 2.17 for the tutorial data. So the lowest I go is a bidding of 4, which would give you a pixel size of around 8.5 angstroms per pixel. All right, the next set of parameters are relevant to the Tomo CPR. And they are simply just a low pass filter that is where we restrict the search space when we're aligning the individual subtomogram fiducial markers against each projection. And then some experimental parameters that you don't need to worry about right now that are a new way of refining the defocus. For subtomogram alignment, the only thing that you're going to need to really worry about are this number here which refers to the symmetry applied, and it's only in the C space, so in the plane. Uh, so for the ribosome, it's going to be one for the C1 symmetry. If you're working on something with six-fold symmetry, you put a six there. Uh, raw class name we won't talk about now. Now the raw angle search is what you would specify each cycle for what you want to search in your alignment. The first two digits refer to an out-of-plane alignment and step, and the second two correspond to an in-plane in alignment and step. So in this case, we would search plus or minus 16 degrees in four degree increments. The fifth digit is for a symmetry constraint search. So if you had something with threefold symmetry and you put a three there, then it would search around all the symmetry related positions. 
that's sort of something that in most cases you're going to not want to have and it doesn't even need to be specified in the parameter file things will run fine um, so in principle you could specify a search like this as well where you search out of plane and in plane uh, and the third angle is decided from a combination of these based on a grid search however this is pretty inefficient and for local refinement, it's usually best to alternate between in-plane searches and out-of-plane searches. For the out-of-plane, you might specify plus or minus 16 degrees and 4 degree increments. And then the best uh, match around here will be searched in finer increments around that local area. The next step up are the template matching parameters. So the binning here, as is discussed in the template matching video, is usually chosen to be between 8 and 10 angstrom pixel. Uh, 10 and 8 angstroms per pixel for your object pixel size, and your threshold is going to depend on the specimen and the sizes of the areas you've chosen to reconstruct. If you've done split each tilt series into two for the ribosome data set, uh, you get about 400, or more reasonably if you split it into four, you would specify about 200. And here the angle search, we actually do the out of plane and in plane because there is no refinement stage, it's a single search. Uh, and we don't have symmetry here, so we're going to specify the full range, 180. And the ribosome is pretty big, so we can get away with a coarser search and still get reasonable uh, results. There's nothing as far as a bandpass specified here because everything is already handled and filtered internally to 40 angstroms for the template matching. The class reference and alignment, I'm not going to explain right now. Uh, that'll be in a later, more advanced tutorial. The FSC parameters, there's only two that you need to consider for basic usage. There's the FSC B factor, which you want to have greater than zero, but for regular alignment, you want to keep it less than 10. And that really is just apply a correction for the detector's MTF. Uh, in a final alignment, you could change this to something to apply a B factor sharpening, say, of 100. The FSC gold split on TOMOS is an important parameter depending on your sample. So for the ribosomes and for anything that's pretty well isolated, we would have this set to zero. And what that does is it randomly divides your data from the template matching into two even and odd half sets, just based on the total number of subtomograms. If, however, you have something like a virus capsid where one tomogram may share overlapping information with its neighboring subtomogram, just dividing randomly isn't good enough because then even though you may have split and kept things two separate, two neighboring particles, if they're in opposite half sets, can share information and overlap. So if you have something where that might be the case, any kind of pseudo symmetric lattice, you would change this to one. And what that does is it divides the even and odd half sets based on the tomogram they came from. So everything in a given tomogram will be either even or odd. So obviously, if you only have one or two tomograms, this is not going to work as well, but that's just the name of the game. Uh, again, classification parameters we'll talk about in another video. And then your microscope parameters are something you'll need to set up. So for this particular tutorial data set, the pixel size is 2.17 angstroms. And everything here is specified in SI units, so that e to the negative 10 just gives you angstroms. It's not a super resolution data set. If you turn this flag to one, it'll assume that you've done the tilt series alignment at super resolution, but everything after that will go back to the raw data and it will Fourier crop it to the physical Nyquist frequency to help remove any aliasing uh, from noise. The spherical aberration for this particular microscope is 2.7 millimeters. That's gonna be true for a lot of, uh, a lot of you doing experiments. Uh, the voltage is 300 kilovolts. In amplitude contrast, you can choose a value between generally 0.07 and 0.14. 0.1 seems to work well for a lot of things. The defocus estimate is generally pretty robust. However, you want to get it reasonably close. Um, an important thing, too, is to make sure that the defocus window doesn't go negative, but there is a, you know, a catch in the code to handle that. So for the Reliant data set, anyhow, uh, 3.5 micron plus or minus 2 is generally sufficient. Uh, the defocus cutoff is how far out the CTF is fit. Um, so for tomography data, 7 to 8 angstroms is generally pretty sufficient unless you have really clean, good data. You could go further, uh, and that's discussed in the CTF estimation video, how to choose that. Your cumulative electron dose is your total cumulative dose summed over all projections. 
So in this case, it's 60 electrons per angstrom squared. B diameter, if you have gold fiducials, is going to be specified here, and that's important for erasing those gold beads. So we have 10 nanometers. And then the astigmatism parameter is just define the search range for any astigmatism. You could turn it off if you wanted, but this is pretty stable and pretty useful, so I'd recommend you just leave these alone. The number of workers uh, is not a relevant parameter anymore, so we'll get rid of that. <laughs> um, and then your delta Z tolerance and Z shift, these are for basically looking at the CTF gradient to make sure that you have your handedness correct. Um, or that's just the Z shift, I should say. The delta Z tolerance is how much you're willing to include in the averaging of the periodograms. So 50 nanometers is pretty reasonable. Um, including more will give you better low resolution signal, but it'll start to blur the high resolution signal. So you can choose wisely there. Uh, a smaller number will also run faster. I would leave the padded size and tile size and overlap pretty much alone, but the tile size, you need a minimum size to be able to get enough signal uh, and also to include the high frequency information. Overlap just results in a lower uh, noise in the final periodogram average. And the padded size is important to avoid aliasing. So you want to make this pretty big. And for the GPUs we're using, making it smaller than 1024 doesn't really make a big difference. And then there's some advanced options. So these 3D CTF correction options, I would leave, also leave alone for now. Feel free to shoot a question over onto the mailing list if you're curious about what these do. Um, and if you're wondering about how we choose the step size for how large a region we allow to reconstruct at a given defocus, that's handled internally. Um, you can turn on or off the cones that are used to estimate an anisotropic Fourier shell correlation, uh, you should leave this as zero or two. Two being on and with a fine sampling. One is a coarser sampling, but I don't really use that very often. And zero would be to turn it off and just do a regular spherical Fourier shell correlation. Uh, classification is disabled until you turn it on. This parameter is uh, important, so the flag symmetrized subtomos. So if you've specified that you have symmetry, that will be applied to the averaging of your subvolumes so that you get a higher signal noise reference. It can also be applied in the alignment, which is a unique feature in EM Clarity because we interpolate the particles back into the base reference frame of the microscope. It's, however, very expensive in terms of computation. So if you have a six-fold symmetry, you have to do six times as many interpolations for every single position you examine in the alignment. In your very end stages, it could be useful. So you could turn this on to one if you'd like. Uh, but if you leave it as zero, then the symmetry is only applied to the averaging and not the alignment. We have the duplicate radius and sampling. I wouldn't change these too much. Uh, the sampling you could increase or decrease a little if you want, same with the radius, but it basically is just the range that's searched to make sure that you haven't had some subvolume drift onto the position of another one, which would, of course, create some statistical interdependence between half sets. The CCC cutoff, if you apply a value here, will give you a cutoff that's applied to the averaging and alignment, so it'll ignore volumes but not delete them below a given cross correlation coefficient. Uh, remove bottom percent as it sounds in this case it doesn't just ignore those volumes but it actually takes them out of consideration so if you say ignore 0.5 it'll cut out the lowest 50 percent of your scoring volumes i'd recommend not using this uh, there is a parameter that's in these advanced options down here that automatically downweights the contribution of lower scoring volumes so rather than deleting them you can just still retain a low resolution signal from these and that's the generally the better way to go the multi-reference alignment is something we're not going to cover now, but if you wanted to turn that on, you'd do that here. And of course, you need to use classification in order to make that happen. Uh, and this parameter is also related to the multi-reference alignment. These final experimental options are a combination of experimental and troubleshooting options, and I may have you adjust one or two of those if you are having a particular uh, issue that you come across. So that is, in a nutshell, the parameter file feel free to send me any questions you might have. Thanks for listening.